This is Jocko Podcast number 215. With Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. Got a little quote to kick things off today. The general who does not advance to seek glory or does not withdraw to avoid punishment but cares for only the people's security and promotes the people's interest is the nation's treasure. That's a little Sun Tzu coming at you. And of course, we covered Sun Tzu on podcast number 23. And you can it's just always interesting how you can find the same themes throughout time from a leadership perspective. I know I talk about this this point a lot in Leadership Strategy and Tactics book. This statement right here is this 2,500 years old. And he's saying the same thing that I say in Leadership Strategy and Tactics, that many of the problems that come about for a leader are from their ego. And so we have to learn to keep our ego in check. Now this is, you know, we talk about it in Extreme Ownership, the very first book. This isn't like, hey, I just thought of this yesterday. And it's not like I just thought of this anyway. So like, like I said, mm-hmm. somebody was jumping on, uh, somebody was, was making some comments on, on social media platform that they said, he's acting like he, like me, I'm acting like I invented cover and move. You know, you know I, of course I said, hey, no, it's actually, I say all the time, I didn't invent this or much of anything. Mm-hmm. So I didn't invent this idea of ego. I didn't just think of it, whatever. Uh, but it is a theme that we see over and over again from people that pay attention. Mm-hmm. Not just from a leadership perspective either. I mean, we're talking life problems. So this was interesting. So we just wrapped up the Jocko live tour. It was awesome. Thanks for everyone that came. I got some really good questions along the way. And a lot of times the questions, sometimes the questions are about ego, even though the person doesn't even know that the question's about ego. But when you start to dig in, you start to realize that it's about ego. But the, the so this first question is one of those questions. And the question was, something along the lines of this. It was something like, what should I do if a peer of mine is working hard, putting in extra effort, and trying to shine so that they get promoted? That was the question. Mm -hmm. And that's a good question, right? Because, right, what do you do? And and the instinct is, well, like, you know what I'm saying? You, You can even feel that instinct. I can see the look on your face right now. Yes. You have the look on your face of like, you can see that that's a little bit offensive, yeah. right? When you go, oh, this person's trying to work hard, trying to put that extra effort in, yeah. <laughs> trying to shine yeah. so that they can get promoted, yeah. right? No one likes that person, by the way, right? No one likes the, the brown noser. Yeah. So we get it. So then the question was, what should this person do? What, you know, the guy asked me, what do I do when that's happening? And the instinct, which is the instinct you had, which is the instinct, my first instinct, even me, Mr. Keep Your Ego in Check, Mm -hmm. my very first instinct is like a little bit of like a pushback. Like, oh, it's that guy, and I want to lash out at him, right? But that's not the right answer. You know, because that's what you say, is you say, who do they think they are? Yeah. Look at what they're doing. So, you know what that is? That's making those attacks? That's your own personal ego. That's my own ego. My own ego going, well, that person just wants to get promoted. So, if you can take a second, you can take a step back, you can detach, you can put your ego in check, and if you do that, then you say to yourself, okay, here's here's the situation. If we remove the ego, here's the situation. This person is working extra hard. By the way, this person's a peer, so we're on the same team. This person is working extra hard. They are putting in extra effort. They are trying to shine. And all those things, all those things are actually good for your team. Right? I got someone that's trying to do a great job, that's working harder. I'm actually happy. I'm actually happy. 
If there's a person working harder on my team, that's good. If there's a person that's trying to outwork me and do a better job than me, that's actually awesome. Because now we're gonna be a better team. Mm-hmm. Now mind you, any moment you let your ego slip into this, it's t- it turns into a nightmare. It's not good. You don't like it. Mm-hmm. You're offended that someone's trying to work harder than you. Yep. But if you p- keep your ego in check, then that's good. You realize that it's good. And I'll tell you something else, and this is what I, what I answered this question. I said, for this person to outwork me, he's gonna have a hard time. He's gonna have a hard time outworking me because I'm here to win too. Mm-hmm. And that is a little bit of my ego. Mm-hmm. But that, that ego is being a positive thing. Because I'm, oh, you're gonna step up your game, guess what I'm gonna do? Step up my game. I'm not gonna undermine you, that would be negative. That would be my ego causing a problem. But if I go, oh, you're, Echo's stepping up his game. Echo's showing up at, at six o'clock in the morning instead of, instead of 6.10. Oh, and I'm, and I'm coming in at 6.05, guess what? Guess what time I'm coming in tomorrow? Six. No, 4.30. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right, Six. so I, I, do, I just do a little bit more. So now, now we're both a little bit more prepared. Now we got some good competitiveness going on. That's good. It's good for the team. So you, this other person, this other person that's stepping up the game, trying to do a good job is actually awesome. Because it's gonna make me step up my game. And I'm gonna tell you right now, that person is gonna have a hard time outworking me. They're gonna have a hard time, bring it. I'm actually fired up. I'm actually getting fired up right now. Like I'm getting, I'm I'm starting like, I'm thinking I might attack you right now just to see what's up. (laughs) All right, there you go. So that's good. Now here's here's where the second ego scenario that you have to get under control. What if that person steps up their game, I step up my game, they end up, they actually do end up outshining me. They actually do end up getting the big promotion. Mm -hmm. Then what do I do? Do I get bitter? Do I get jealous? Do I get mad? Do I now start to undermine them and spread rumors about, no, actually. If somebody, if somebody outworked me mm-hmm. and outperformed me and then got promoted, good for them. That is awesome. Credit. Yeah. They get a credit. You done good, son. Yeah. <laughs> you done good. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing wrong with that. And what I am going to do is instead of being bitter and mad and jealous and all those things, instead I'm actually going to put my ego out of the picture and say what actually happened. Where did this person perform better than me? And how I how can I support them? How can I learn some lessons from this? And how can I become better so the next time there is an opportunity, I do get promoted? You wouldn't think that that question is about your own personal ego from the beginning. Now it's easy to see looking back. Yeah. But from the beginning it's like, hey, what do you do? How do you handle this situation when someone's trying to outwork you and outshine you and they're trying to get promoted? Yeah. That sounds like an interpersonal relationship question. It's not. Mm. It's a question about ego. Which is which is something we always need to pay attention to. So so as I was thinking again once again Jocko Live was kind of like uh, you went to two Jocko Lives, is that correct? Yes. They weren't really a podcast, they weren't really a Q&A, they weren't they were just sort of a, a they were a little bit of everything, right? Yeah, a little yeah. bit of a little bit of stories, a little bit of lessons, a little bit of yeah, a little bit of everything. Yeah. So I did get some questions though. That first one was one of those general questions. And now as I started thinking about the questions and how a lot of them related to ego, another question that I got that was actually another important question. The question was again something along the lines of and I'm sure we can go back and and Pull the recording. Yes. But here's the other thing is some of these questions that I got asked, I got asked like the same similar question. So I'm paraphrasing what this other question was. But this one, the question was something along the lines of, hey, listen, Jocko, I know that keeping the ego in check is an important principle. I read about it, extreme ownership. You talk about it all the time. Got to be humble. But at my company, ego is a huge problem. How do I get my company to start promoting the ideal of humility? And how do I get them to recognize that ego is such a big problem? Now, this is a really good question, once again. Because you can imagine what this 
individuals, right? Like, you know, you're at a company where there's a lot of egos going on and all of a sudden you have a little moment of enlightenment. You realize that ego is causing you a lot of problems. So you start putting your own ego in check. And then you go, oh, wow, this is working. Mm. I'm doing better. I'm coordinating better. I'm working, inter- my interpersonal relationships with the other people on the team are better. My relationships with people on other teams are better. We're getting more done because our relationships are better. Mm. I'm putting the team and the mission above myself. That means the team and the mission are doing better. That's great. So you realize all this stuff. <laughs> and then you say, okay, well, how do I start to spread the word? How do I get other people to do this? And this is a tricky question, right? It's a tricky thing because if some, if like, let's say your team has, you see that ego is a problem and you sit them down and go, listen guys, you're, you're all, you all got big egos and that's the problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're going to run into level nine defensiveness. You're actually going to, it's actually going to go beyond defensiveness. They're going to start attacking you. That's what's going to happen. When you got all these crazy egos, they're going to gang up. They'll like unite. <laughs> They'll put their egos aside for a split second so that can unite against you. Mm-hmm. So you can't confront them. And and once again, are there certain relationships that you could have with someone where I go, hey, let's say you and me and, and you had an ego, and but you and I were really tight. And I said, hey, man, you're letting your ego get in the way of this. Sure, that can, that, that is a possibility. That is a very rare occurrence. Most of the people that you work with on a regular basis, you don't have that type of a relationship. The other thing is, when someone has a big ego, that's not the type of person that's open to those kind of criticisms anyways. Mm. So it's like there's two two hurdles that you have to overcome. Number one, your relationship isn't usually that good. And number two, they have a big ego, which is part of the problem, and that's what makes the problem hard to attack. Mm -hmm. So what are you gonna do? And, and I gotta throw this one more little thing. When people talk about the, you know how someone say, but wouldn't it be better if you could just talk to them? Wouldn't it be better if you just, you know, put down on some bulletized list and said, hey, here's the things that your ego, here's the problems that your ego's problem causing. Look, I get it. And isn't it great to have direct conversations? Isn't it great if I can just sit you down, if, you, if Echo, if you and I have this mind meld, where you just know I'm 100% looking out for you and you're open to, like if we have that, that's in an ideal world, that's great. Mm -hmm. That's great. Uh, Golf clap. It's It's great. The problem is it doesn't exist very often and confronting someone that has an ego about their ego can often just exacerbate the problem. So here's what you do. Instead of, self-identifying the problem and pointing the fingers at other people, which by the way is placing blame, which is a problem. Mm -hmm. So instead of doing that, what we're gonna do is start pulling the thread on some of the problems that we're having on the team. So for instance, this group over here needs some help on their part of the project, but no one's helping them. What's going on? If you start to pull the thread on that, you'll find at the end of that thread, they'll be hanging some egos. Mm. Whether it's the ego of the person that doesn't want to ask for help, or whether it's the ego of the other person that doesn't want to give help because they think they need to do their own job. That's I'm not not doing that. Mm. So you pull the thread, and at the end, you'll find these little egos hanging, and then what you do is you just expose them. And you say, well, what do you think the root of the problem is? And you start pulling that thread and you get to a point where someone says, you can finally have an open conversation where you say, where someone finally says, well, you know, I, I, guess, I, I guess I could use some help. Oh. You just discovered it. So that's like a cover and move situation, right? If cover and move isn't happening and it isn't happening because of egos, if you pull the thread, you'll get to the end of the thread and it will be attached to someone's ego in most cases. Is there a possibility that it's like, hey, this group doesn't know what the other group's doing? Yeah, absolutely. Those are, but those are easy problems to solve because we can just pull the thread. We find at the end, oh, we need, to, we need better coordination between these two teams. Cool, there it is. Mm-hmm. When you pull the thread and it comes out, the, the little ego's dangling on the end of it. Then you go, okay, let's expose these and let's try and ask questions to figure out and get people to realize what they're looking at. Mm. You want them to come to that conclusion. That's the trick. That's the maneuver. 
is to get them to come to conclusion. And they might never verbalize it, but they go, yeah, in their mind, they're yeah. like, mm, I guess I didn't want to ask for help because my ego is in the way. So there's one, uh, you know, if, if you got people that aren't taking, aren't keeping things simple, just go through the laws of combat. Simple. Make, people are making the plans too complex. And yet they keep doing it. And they're, when, it, when you go and say, hey, you know, these plans seem like they're really complex. And of course they say something like, hey, the, I don't think everyone understood the plan. It seemed, it seemed kind of complex. And the person says, people need to pay more attention when I'm briefing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you pull on that, right? The frontline troops, they need more detail. Because they, otherwise they're going to screw up. That's why it's so complex. It's like, well, okay. Let's look at what's really happening. What's really happening is I've created a plan that I won't give up because my ego's too big. Right? When you pull that thread and you go, listen, hey, the, the frontline troops don't understand what to do. It seems like that could be a real problem. Mm-hmm. And, and maybe, and, and this is another thing, you give them a little out. You give them a little out, like, you know, maybe we just need to back it off a little bit so that they can understand it. Maybe they're not as smart as you. Right. <laughs> Get a little ego massage. goes, and fine. you know what? Fine. I'll simplify it. Boom. Yep. <laughs> and in the meantime, you've given them a little indication. Look, if you confront them, I, that's what I'm saying. It's hard for people to want to play the long game here. Because the short game is a, you're, you're, you think you're so smart, your plans are too complex, and you're sticking with them because you've got a big ego. Yep. How's that going to work out? Mm-hmm. It's not going to work out good. Can it work out 4% of the time? Yes. The other, the other 96% of the time, you get a defensive person that's now accusing other people. It's Take the indirect and play the long game. Take the indirect attack and play the long game. Uh, prioritize and execute, right? Why is that failing? Because again, this question is ego is a problem. So where does ego manifest as a problem? It can manifest as a problem in, in prioritize and execute. Because if someone's got a big ego, and they're not getting things done, and they go, I can get it done, because their ego thinks they can do anything, right? Mm. Or prioritize, connect, execute, ego can be a problem. If you have a project and I have a project, and you need help, and your project is actually more important and I should give you resources, but instead I'm like, my, pro- my initiative is just as important as Echo's is, yeah. which is just my ego, I should look at it and say, okay, you know what, you should be the priority. Mm-hmm. And another good one is, yeah, well, it's just what I just said. Like, hey, I'm not going to give up. Why should I have to give my resources to Echo? Those are mine. Those are mine. No. Actually, what's the, what's the biggest priority? Okay, put my ego aside. Echo's priority is actually bigger than mine. I'm going to give him four of my people so that he can get the job done. So when you pull the thread on this and you say, well, hey, hey, why is it, Jonka, why is it you don't want to give people to Echo? And I'm like, well, you know, uh, what if something else comes up? Well, if something else comes up, you can give back. Well, <laughs> you know, they, they got to learn to respect the chain of command. Well, they still work for you. They'll just be loaned over to Echo. Whoa. You see what I'm saying? Yes, they It's do. just ego, <laughs> ego, ego, ego. So these are the kind of problems that manifest themselves inside of a company wrapped around ego. Mm-hmm. And decentralized command, you can have the same thing happen with decentralized command. How does ego p- cause a problem with decentralized command? It's like this. Hey, I noticed that um, you know, you seem to be making all the decisions and the folks out in the field don't really have the opportunity to kind of make calls. Why is that? I'm the only one that has the experience to do this. <laughs> mm-hmm. They don't have the skill that I have, mm-hmm. right? So there's all these reasons that, that one of those are ego problems, right? And and by the way, if it's if it's not an ego problem, then I then then I say, oh, you know what? Because I haven't really trained the guys well enough, and I'm gonna, you know what? You're right. I've been making way too many detailed decisions for the guys out in the field. I need to get down there, make sure they know what's going on, train them better, so that I can back off. Cool. That's a person that's got their ego in check. Mm-hmm. The person that's like, I'm the only one that can do this. Like, no, you can't. You no, you're not. Mm-hmm. And if you are, you're wrong. Because right now you got three people working for you. What happens when you have eight? Are you going to go around the field in all these different locations to make every single decision? No, you can't. Mm-hmm. So get your ego under control. Realize that you're not the only one that can do this job. And train your people properly. Again, that's a direct assault. 
probably going to cause problems. Mm-hmm. Instead, if we just pull the thread on it, hey, what's going on? It seems like you're, you know, the folks down the field don't have a lot of authority. Well, you know, they don't experience. Oh, okay. You, it's kind of cumbersome, though, like them reaching back to you all the time to make these decisions. It is, but, you know, I'm the one that really knows how to do it. Oh, I mean, what, what happens if, you know, you're sick or, you know, you, someone's got to, you don't have communications with them? What? what, what? Do you think it would be a good idea, you know, since you have so much knowledge and experience to maybe pass that on to some of the other people? Well, yeah. Okay, cool. Let's make that happen. And then obviously, ego can absolutely manifest itself when it comes to taking ownership. I mean, all day long, right? What? Oh, that, that project failed. What happened? My, my subordinates don't, know, don't want to step up. Oh, so it's their fault. <laughs> why, why, why aren't your subordinates taking ownership? Because they don't even know what ownership is. They don't want to take ownership. Oh, okay. So it's not your fault. No. <laughs> okay, well, what can we do to help them? Mm-hmm. Pull the string. And you, at the bottom, the person will see it's their ego. They might not admit it, but they'll see it. And then they can start to make adjustments. Now look, can any of these situations escalate in a point where indirect, 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 indirect doesn't work? And eventually you say, you know what? I gotta gotta sit echo down and say, listen, here's what I think is the root of the problem. The root of the problem is you think you're the only one that knows how to do this. And in thinking that, you're not training anybody. Like, I might have to get that direct. Mm -hmm. It does happen. We prefer to use the minimum force required when it comes to leadership, just like being a bouncer. Yes, sir. Right? It's not, hey, the guy's a little out of line, hit him in the head with a blackjack. (laughs) No, it's like, hey, you're, hey, sir, you know, I think you've had enough for tonight. Can can you come with me? Mm -hmm. That's minimum force required. If the guy says, okay, cool, it's problem solved. Mm -hmm. If he's, if he says, I'm not going anywhere. Okay, well, we have to escalate. It's the same thing here, but don't start with the direct attack. Just like you don't club the person out of the gate. I think it's a slapjack. I'm not sure, but you know. Okay. That's what you're talking about, that yeah. leather thing. With yeah, the yeah, a blackjack, yeah. Blackjack? Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a black. Did you guys not use uh, those? That's Ill- I think those are illegal to That's have. That's illegal. Yeah, yeah, the slapjack. Yeah. One guy had one. Yeah. But yeah, I think they're illegal. So we don't want to escalate straight to the blackjack. Yes. Or even a slapjack. Or even a slapjack. If jack. anyone's using a slapjack. I think it's called a slapjack. Okay. I'm not sure. Point remains. I dig it. Fairly 100%. confident you're wrong, but not 100%. Yeah, I'm like, I'm like. You know when 75. someone, you know when you're pretty confident about something and somebody just throws a little randomness into the soup and it makes you question yes, yourself? Yeah. That's how I feel right now. Yeah, that's my. Real answer. confident with a little bit of questions in there. <laughs> If it makes you feel any better, that's my everyday life, so whatever. <laughs> so that's the answer to this question, is really pulling the thread on the problem to reveal the root of the problem, which you're gonna see as ego, and then it's there for the people, hopefully, to see it, to recognize it, to possibly admit it, maybe not, give them an out where they can actually make an adjustment without taking the ownership of the ego, because that's okay. Yeah. We're trying to win, right? We're trying to let the team win. We're not trying to, we're not, get, well, my goal is not to make you admit it. Because you know what that is? What? That's my ego. No, yeah, I'm like, gonna show them yeah, that yeah. he's got a big ego. Get him to admit yeah, it. Get him to admit it. That's yeah. not what my goal is. My goal is to make you make better decisions as a leader so that we win as a team. Yeah. So that's what we're, that's what we're trying to do here. It's real interesting that how you laid that out because you used to do that to me. Uh oh. Probably still do. Maybe. But it was less about the ego, I think, anyway. And maybe it's all the same. Maybe at the end of the day, it's all the same. It's possible. Because skating, you're or, or trying to dance around. Okay, so explain to me how I would do this to you. You do it with excuses. Okay, so like if something didn't get done or can't get done or I think it's too hard. And really, most of the time, if I'm remembering correctly, it was at the end of the day, this is what it was. It was like, 
I'm too lazy or <laughs> whatever, you know? So it'd always be like this excuse like, well, you know, that's this or that's that. And then you'd have all these, just like how you're saying, and I, and it, it, it made me remember this because of your tone. How mm. you were like kind of saying those little answers there. <laughs> <laughs> like, ooh, that's the same tone you use with me. Like real simple. Just like, well, just here. Here's the solution to that problem right here. Because mm. there's all these little excuses that you make, you know, like, oh, I didn't really have time because I had to do this. And you'd be like, oh, okay, th- then you just do this, you know, and that'll solve that particular problem. You didn't have this big comprehensive plan to solve oh. my life problem. You were like, okay, for every excuse I would make, you just have the little solve, yeah. you know, the problem or the solution to it. And I'd be like, oh, man. And meanwhile, you're getting backed into this corner or the string is just getting pulled. Like mm-hmm. ev- with every pull. And you start like- to sense what's down there. <laughs> in yeah. your case, it was laziness. Oh, yeah. Like I just was too lazy or I'm just like stuck in this routine or whatever. And then so it could in a way be like, OK, that's just my ego. Just thinking that the way that's not the way I do things kind of thing. And, and think if I would have used a different tone. Well, think if I would have just uh, said that's because you're lazy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're just being lazy, Echo. Yeah, you'd have been like, well, you don't even know what it takes to make one of these things. Oh, you know what I mean? And then oh, all yeah. of a sudden, we 100%. and what does that do to our relationship? Yeah, and what does that do to do to the final product? Yeah, yeah. Right now, you're doing something against your will. Oh yeah, oh, with some man. disdain a with little bit. With some disdain on it. Yeah, fully. And the, yeah, if you would have just been like, hey, you're lazy. This is what my mind would have went to. This belief. This actually, and in a way, it's true, but it doesn't like get anyone anywhere. Where if you would be like, you're lazy, uh, I would have thought and maybe even said that it's not that I'm lazy. It's just you're just this crazy hard worker who mm-hmm. have these standards that are unreasonable for a normal person. Mm-hmm. And I'm just a normal person. Excuse me. You know, kind of an attitude. <laughs> That's what I would go to rather than. If you like the way how you always do it is like you pull a string or you just sort of you know what's you know what's interesting too is when I'm doing that I'm not doing that like okay I got here's my next move on echo yeah actually what I'm doing is like well you know when you say well we can't I can't make a video because it's gonna take me too long to get through the the raw edits and I go you know I'll say like well hey, you know if you want just get you you know hire someone to do those raw edits for you would that work? Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm, yeah. a, I'm asking you a yeah. legitimate question. Oh, yeah. Maybe I kind of know the answer. I mean, I suspect I know the answer, but it's not It's not just, hey, I, I'm setting you up. Mm-hmm. I'm legitimately pulling the thread. Yeah. And the answer might be it is impossible to get this project done. Mm-hmm. But when I say, well, you could hire someone to do those raw edits, and then you go, okay, well, even if I hire someone, how am I going to transfer all this data? And I go, well, if you want, what, couldn't you get an external hard drive and, and just physically give it to him? Yep. And you'd say, well, these aren't actual situations. No, no, I know. I don't know the realm of video well enough to, <laughs> to go down those roads. The main, the, the one that I remember the easiest is like with training. Mm. Like you'll be like, hey, we're training at 430, but I train during the day mostly. Mm-hmm. Right? Oh, not in the evening. Then you'll be like, oh, yeah, train at 4.30. I'm like, well, you know, and I have all these reasons. And then you're like, you kind of just chip away at all these reasons. <laughs> like, oh, here's the solution to that. Here's the solution to that. Here's the solution. It's like, man, I just, I look, that's just like my routine. I just got to admit it, you yeah. know, like, all right. And But I don't get to train with you guys as often, you know, kind of thing. But it's like, yeah, you expose, you mm. pull the string to expose just the, like, the little, the little excuses. Check. So pull the thread. Reveal the problem. Don't confront if you can help it. And people will start to recognize what the problem is. I mean, this is assuming you're working with this. Is, well, there's one, there's one problem with this. And that is if the person has a giant ego, th- this is the hardest thing for them to admit, right? Yeah. So they might not admit it, but they'll see it. They'll behave differently. And by the way, one of the good ways to, to, use someone's ego against themselves is when you say something along the lines of, you know, man, it's going to look good if this gets done right. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? And they think, oh, cool. I'm going to do this. I'm going to make this adjustment just so it gets done, just so my ego can get, just so I can win. Yeah, that that was going to say that. Use the word win. Because every time like you use the word win, and any time when I'd be thinking like, okay, 
if I didn't win, what else, you know, what's left? You lost. Yeah. No matter what excuse you make, you lost. So if you put, if you put shed light on, like, use that word and be like, hey, this will make you win. And you're like, hell yeah. But at the same time, the back of your mind, like, basically, if we don't solve these problems or whatever, I lose. Ooh, I don't want that. So it's like extra motivating. The, uh, it's the winning at all costs thing. And so the winning at all costs, I wrote like a little section and it was part of a one of the special releases on Barnes and Noble's version of Dichotomy of Leadership was this thing, winning at all costs. And it's and then someone posted and I had I had said it before, mm-hmm. right? And someone posted a clip of me saying this idea of winning at all costs. And it's the way that I talk about it. It's kind of a trick anyways, because I go through this thing about what is leadership and leadership is this, leadership is that. And then I say, what well, leadership is to me is winning at all costs. And somebody put, I probably you, put a clip up of me saying that. Mm-hmm. And somebody said, of course, someone's like, that's the kind of person that will run people over and blah, blah, blah. Like, it, like gave it negative things, right. right? But what they don't realize is what the rest of that clip says. Mm-hmm. And what the rest of that, that whole idea of winning at all costs is what I'll do to win at all costs is totally subordinate my ego, help other people, support them, give them what they need, put my put put the team and the mission above myself because the mo- that's how I'm going to win at all costs. So winning at all costs doesn't mean I'm stepping on other people. It means I'm actually lifting other people up. Yeah. That's what it means. So if you can use that, you know, if I say, "Hey, Echo, man, look, we need to win," and you, if we're going to win. The only way to win is if you can learn how to work with Jim. Otherwise, we lose. And you're like, you know what? Because I'm a winner, I'll work with Jim. And right. I'm like, cool. It's a first step. Yeah. Check. And this was kind of related to a question that, and I've got, we haven't done a Q&A in a long time. And this is kind of a partial Q&A. Sure. I don't know. It's just some topics. <clears throat> but anyways, we got one of these questions. Hit it. Yes, Jocko. What do you tell someone who has been passed over for a military promotion they deserved? Could you address this? Yeah, so part of it is what we just talked about. What do you do when you get passed over? Cool. Why did some, and, and it's also covered in, I think there's, a, well, I know, there's a, a literal chapter inside leadership strategy and tactics, which is what to do when, you're, when you don't get promoted. That's, that's the actual name of the chapter. When you're not chosen, page 160, boom, there it is. When you are not chosen, and we covered it on the podcast. So what you do is you go and you say, hey, boss, I know there's opportunities to get promoted. I know I didn't get promoted. I know there must be some shortfalls that I have. Can you help me indicate what those shortfalls are? Cool. So that's, that's and I'll just give a factual. There's the officer commissioning program that I got picked up for. Mm-hmm. It was called the Seaman to Admiral Program. It was a highly selective program. They took 50 sailors from the entire Navy. And there's, I don't know, 250,000 something sailors in the Navy. They took 50. And the first year that I put in for it, I did not get selected. I got actually, I got selected as an alternate, Mm -hmm. which was, as they say, almost worse. Yeah, I see it. Because you don't. You don't like you. You get nothing. You get to smell it. Yeah, you get to smell it. You don't get to touch it. You don't get to taste it. So it was not good. Well, it was good because I was like, okay, I'm I'm close. But so, but I didn't get it. I didn't get it. And what did I do? Assessed and said, what can I do better? And worked harder. And the next year, I got it. Mm. So if you don't get promoted because you deserved it, maybe you didn't deserve it. And if you did deserve it, you'll get it next time. And instead of saying you deserved it, why not look at it and say, okay, what did I not do to make myself the best, absolute best candidate that they could not question needed to get this promotion? Mm -hmm. Instead, we're saying I deserved it, someone else got it. What is that doing? Blaming the boss, blaming the selection process, blaming all these other things that you cannot control. But if you take ownership of it and say, you know what? Okay, I didn't get promoted. There must be some things that I can do better. There's the answer. Mm-hmm. Own it. Ask. Give, give me some feedback, please. What do I need to make this happen? And then implement. Now, this, this, 
There was this other topic that I kind of wanted to bring up that was from, once again, it was from Jocko Live, and, and there was a young woman. And uh, again, this, this goes to the kind of variety of different people that were coming to the Jocko Lives were all over the place. So this, this young woman asked a question that was kind of like, how do you, hand, and I can't, when you're at the live events, there's light shining in your eyes, so you're yeah. not really 100% sure. You don't get it. It's not like the, you're not seeing the person face to face. So I'm kind of looking out into the light. I'm seeing this frame of a, of a young woman, and she asked something along the lines of, you know, how do you handle when there's people that are trying to pull you down and, and, and you know, pick you apart? And I said, well, what do you do? And she's like, I'm in school. And I said, what school? And she's in high school. And I said, what grade? And she said, I'm a freshman. And I said, okay, so you're getting bullied, right? Because essentially that's what, that's what she was saying, right? I'm getting picked on. I got people trying to drag me down. What, you know what that's called? That's called bullying. I said, so you're getting bullied. And she said, yes, getting bullied. So I said, <clears throat> I said, you know, I thought about it for a second. I said, well, I've got some bad news and I've got some good news. And I'm going to start with the bad news. The bad news is that people can be mean. And they can be mean for a variety of reasons. They can be mean because they're insecure. They can be mean because they're bullied themselves. They can be mean because they're unhappy. They can be mean because they're scared to be vulnerable, so they put up that front. They might be suffering and jealous and have no self-esteem. It's the way some people are. And there's some people that are just evil, that get joy out of putting other people down. So there's all... Those kind of people exist, and they especially exist inside of immature people in high school. So that's the bad news. And then I said, but the good news is high school is not life. <laughs> and when I said that, it was actually funny. When I said that, like people started clapping. Because everyone in that room knew that it was true. And that reminded me of another conversation that I've been having with people lately about, uh, about, some, about ecosystems, something I've called ecosystems. So little ecosystems in the world that people get caught up in. And they get caught trying to get to the top hierarchy of some little ecosystem somewhere. And look, I get it. Uh, you know, I get it, Jordan, right? Jordan Peterson, we're sure. trying to ascend the top of our dominance hierarchy, be the best you can. I, I totally get that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But we, there's, there can be a problem with this from multiple angles. The world is filled with these little ecosystems and you know, high school is one of them remember the little high school ecosystem there's someone that's popular there's someone that's you know there's all these little e there's this ecosystem there and high school this is something you know you you look at a high school kid and you you try and explain to them that once you left high school no one really cares right correct if you care about it deeply you're actually Uncle Rico, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yes, if you're the yeah. one that's running around saying, well, when I was in high school this, and when I was in high school that. But here's the problem, and this is one of the reasons when I wrote Way the Warrior Kid, the first one, one of the things that triggered me to write it was, you know, here I was at work, war going on, big, real, legitimate, crazy problems and, and, and dynasties and dynamics to figure out, like things are going on. Mm -hmm. And I'd come home, and like my, one of my kids would be sad that they got called a name mm -hmm. or sad that they got a low grade on a test or whatever. And I would be thinking, like I, I, I had a moment of clarity where I thought, I can't believe they're, 
I can't believe they're sad about this. Who cares? Mm-hmm. And then I realized, oh yeah, idiot, Jocko. Yeah. That thing that's going on in their world is their whole world. It's yeah. the eco. See, it's their entire their entire world is in that one ecosystem. Yeah. So it's hard for people to realize that their ecosystem that they're in is not the whole world. It's the same thing with when you start getting to college. And I've got two kids in college now. You know, this whole ecosystem around first getting into college and once you get to college, you know, where are you going to get your MBA? Where are you doing your internship? There's this whole thing, mm. right? And once again, if you step outside that ecosystem into just the normal world, no one actually cares about where you got your degree. Not no one, because there's a little people, there's a group yeah. of people inside that ecosystem that they where they go, where'd you get your MBA? Oh, where'd you study? You know, and yeah. there's people that care about that. There's other people that literally do not care at all. Yeah. And I meet incredibly, like f- from that perspective, I meet incredibly successful business leaders all the time that don't have their MBA and went to some state school in f- Iowa. I got props the other day from someone from Iowa that said, whenever you think of that state, Mm -hmm. I'm like, yes, from Iowa, Mm -hmm. some state school in Iowa, whatever, some little community college in Nebraska, and they go out in the world and dominate. So, but that's not important. We know that that happens. Look, and there's people that go to Ivy League schools and and they do great too. But what I'm saying is they get in this little ecosystem where, where what they're actually trying to do is climb to the top of that ecosystem only for the sake of climbing to the top of that ecosystem, not how it measures into the greater world. Mm -hmm. What kind of car do you have? There's an ecosystem you can get wrapped up in. You know, I've got, my Porsche is better than your Porsche. Right? Mm -hmm. There's people that are into that. And there's other people that I do not care at all, at all. What about our little ecosystems we're in, right? Well, Jiu-Jitsu has its own, own little ecosystem. Yep. You know what I'm saying? There's a little ecosystem, who's who, what? The, the podcast world yeah, it's everywhere. has an ecosystem. So all these, th- and those are just things that, that you and I are, are actually actively in, right? We do Jiu-Jitsu and we have a podcast. So we could jump into like, where are you at on the hierarchy of these ecosystems? And again, Jordan, I get it. We're trying to, we're trying to go up the hierarchy. Sure. I get it, but you have to be able to put that in check. Because why are you doing that? What is driving you? If it's if what's driving you to ascend that hierarchy is because it's going to make you better and the people around you better, that's good. If you're doing it for your own ego, though, that's a problem. Mm-hmm. That's where it becomes a problem. The, <laughs> guess what? The jobs, the companies, the industries. The, they get created, sorry, the jobs that get created by companies and industries, they have their own little ecosystem, right? About, I worked here, I worked there, I, I ran this region, like you can see it. It's an mm-hmm. ecosystem that exists. The SEAL teams is a freaking ecosystem. And everyone's in there going, you're like, okay, where are you at on the ecosystem? Where did yeah. you, you know, how many deployments have you done? Where did you deploy to? When, what schools have you been to? There's a little ecosystem that people are trying to get up. And it's, and I get it. There's some positive to that, right? Because you're trying to do better. You're trying to work harder. That's good. Then there's, there's thing, the bar scene. You probably can relate to this better than me. Sure. There's an ecosystem of the clubs. Yes. And who's the owner and who's the manager and who's the GM. Yeah. And who's the head door guy? Yeah. And who comes in your club? Oh, who are you going to let in the club? Yeah. Music scene, re- real estate. It, there's just ecosystems everywhere. And so this is the point that I, I guess I'm, I'm getting to and with, where it ties back into this young uh, female that asked this question. When you, ha- you, what you have to do is realize that in most of these cases, when you step outside of that little ecosystem, no one cares about that ecosystem. No one cares. Mm-hmm. No one cares. If I was to tell my mom, hey mom, I got my black belt in jujitsu, 2005. Hey mom, I got my black belt in jujitsu. She, well, you, know what, you know what she would say? Oh, congratulations. You know what she's thinking? That I'm in a strip mall doing karate somewhere. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yep. That's what she's thinking. She doesn't care at all. Yep. 
No. She doesn't care at all. Mm -hmm. uh, your Porsche that you told me about, I can introduce you to many people that think if you spent more than $5,000 on a vehicle, you're an idiot. Mm -mm. Never mind $150,000. In fact, if you ever hear me brag about a vehicle, the vehicle that I brag about probably the most is my 1997 Dodge Grand Caravan. <laughs> That's the one I brag about the most. Mm -hmm. So when you step outside the ecosystem of cool cars, people literally do not do not care. Mm. The, the music scene, oh, I, I know this recording artist. I know, oh, I'm, I'm going to this studio. It's like no one cares. So. My point in saying this is if you find yourself distraught about your failure inside some random ecosystem, then remember that if you can detach and you can step outside that ecosystem, you're going to realize that that ecosystem, in most cases, doesn't even matter at all. Mm. It doesn't matter at all. Detach. This is something that, once again, at Jocko Live shows, this came up, you know, we talk about detachment, I talk about detachment. One of the things, look, detachment is a great tool as a leader to have because it allows you to take a step back and see what's going on, right? Clearly, it's a powerful tool. But you combine that aspect of detachment to this other aspect of detachment when, when we've talked about people that get caught in a bad mental headspace, and I don't know if I want to use the word depression because I'm not a psychologist and I've never really had this depression, so I can't really speak about it from that angle. But to say that people get caught in a rut, that happens. Mm -hmm. And I've talked about that idea, like let's say, okay, uh, when you, when if you lose someone, right, someone that you know dies, and you get put into that rut. And the way I've described it before is like there's a storm cloud all around your head. Mm -hmm. And no matter which direction you look, you see storm cloud. And anyone that's on the outside, and this is what I've said, anyone that's on the outside look at you and go, oh man, you're just surrounded by the storm. If you, if you step over here, you're going to get away from that. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. But from their perspective, they don't see it at all. If you can detach if you can take a step back from your own head, you can actually see the end of the storm clouds and you can see that you can get your way out of this rut that you're in. Mm. Now, people ask me about how to detach, and I talk about it leadership strategy and tactics, but I'm gonna take a, a little bit further. <laughs> Think about this, so here's a couple things, and, and actually the reason that I, I start, I used to kind of look at it um, like, hey, it's real simple, right? Hey, take a step back. Just take a step back, take a breath, right? You know, look around. In fact, relax, look around, and make a call was what I wrote about extreme ownership when it, when it comes to detach. Like, relax, look around, make a call. That's detachment. Mm -hmm. the, the first time I really broke it down to try and give people some more specific instructions was on the Warrior Kid podcast. Because you know a little kid would say, when I get mad, I, I start to lose my temper when I'm wrestling, or I start to lose my temper when I'm in class and little Billy's keeps poking me in the back of the head. How do I not lose my temper? Well, what they need to do is detach. So I said, listen, take a step back. So I thought about what I kind of do. Take a step back. And one of the things I said was, lift your chin up. Mm. Lift your chin up, and now, now when you start to think, because I was talking about why do I even do that? What what benefit does that have? Well, if you think about when you take a step back and you actually lift up your chin, think about what it does to your vision. All of a sudden, your vision is elevated. It's elevated one inch, but it's elevated, yeah. and you now have a physical new perspective. You have a physically new perspective of what's going on mm -hmm. by taking a step back, lifting your chin up. The other thing it makes you do is if you put your head back, it like makes you open up your chest and open up your lungs and it makes you take a breath. Which I used to attribute this to when you're on the radio. Look, one of the reasons that I, was, that I like thought about detaching and something that I got realized was a good tool is you never wanna sound panicked on the radio and the SEAL teams. Mm -hmm. 
So before you key up that microphone to say something, you go, yeah. <sighs> and then you say, all right, guys, we need to move towards that north building instead of, no, you don't do that. So when you, when you lift your chin up, you, you, know, you kind of take a breath. It forces you to kind of take a breath. And the other, this is the coolest thing that I kind of connected this mm-hmm. at Jocko Live. And the reason I connected it, because I was up, like right now we're sitting down and we're kind of, we're kind of stuck in this position. So at Jocko Live, I had like, a, like a, a lavalier microphone on. So I was up and moving around and getting crazy. So as I was going through this, I was acting out the, the process of detaching. So I take a step back, I lift up my chin, and I made this connection. I was like, think about the posture that you have when you're getting ready to get into a fight. Yeah. It's literally the opposite. You lift up your hands, you duck, you tuck your chin down, you roll your shoulders forward to protect yourself, and you are getting in this defensive posture, which is not an open posture for seeing what's going on, right? It's a focused posture. Yeah. When you take a step back, you lift up your chin, you're actually making yourself physically vulnerable. And what you're also doing is you're, so you're opening yourself up to threats, but you're opening up your mind to see a different perspective. So that is incredibly important. It's an incredibly important first step in training yourself how to detach from all this chaos that's going on, from the mayhem of a leadership situation to Detaching from your own ecosystem that you're wrapped up in, that you think is important, that no one cares about. Mm -hmm. No one cares about outside that stupid club you're in. Mm -hmm. No one cares. No one cares. Outside the, 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 the 38 people that are involved in your glee club, <laughs> they, they've got you paranoid and freaking out. No one cares. Yeah. So if you can take a step back and you can see that, and finally, if you can take a step back from your own brain and you can kind of assess that cloud that you're caught in, you'll see that that cloud is not infinite and you'll see that there's a way out, mm-hmm. which is important. Very important. Yeah. Yeah, that that and that can get more strong and powerful. That that lure, that sucking, like keeping you in your ecosystem when it's like part of your routine, you know? Because mm-hmm. it kind of feeds into your identity a lot of times. Like in jujitsu, super strong. Like where you, you know, if you get tapped out by a guy who never mm-hmm. taps you out or some brat, that'll follow you all the way home with your fam. You know, your family. You're thinking, man, that guy tapped me out today. Like it can, you know, if oh, your yeah. mind is just sucked in because it's kind of part of your identity, or whatever. But yeah, if you can just step back look around kind of detach from that you're like bro no one cares like no every cares. literally every other environment that you go in <laughs> in life nobody cares that guy tap no one cares that you'd even do jujitsu no one unless you got to spring into action at the yeah. store or something then they're like stoked this. yeah yeah they're, they're like happy. what was that yeah this we, dude just worked magic this dude's a ninja <laughs> yeah, yeah, he put exactly. that guy to sleep exactly yeah. which is probably never gonna happen by the way as far as probability goes i think and i think when you're younger, I mean, obviously, when you're younger, you get you get caught up in these ecosystems oh, much yeah. more. Yeah. And this, what's scary is, this can be the downfall of a kid, yeah. right? You get caught up in the drug ecosystem, you get caught up in the booze ecosystem, you get caught up in the in the what is it delinquency? Like, hey, I'm going to cause problems. Hey, you know what do boys do? Boy, this is another thing that came out of Jocko Live. Like boys are trying to prove themselves yeah. to their friends and to themselves. Yeah. How tough they are, how cool they are. So when what whatever whatever little ecosystem has their own little cool meters in it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And sometimes that cool meter is, you know, I'm getting so I'm gonna drink this fifth of Jack. Yeah. Or I'm gonna smoke this or whatever. Like that's a, they want to move up in that ecosystem, and so they do stuff that outside outside that ecosystem, people go, hey, that's actually one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. Yeah. But yeah. you can't see that. 
Yeah, the party scene is a big one. I mean, there's a difference between like getting caught in the ecosystem of the party scene and then going <laughs> down the spiral of like drugs and addiction. Because a lot of times, addiction is like that's just like a chemical payoff you get, mm. and then that chemical payoff you you want so much, it's just more of a payoff than literally anything yeah, else yeah. in life, and you, and then it just compounds. But you it's know? the ecosystem that introduces you to the payoff that ends up being an addiction that ends up ruining your life. Yes. So yeah, like the party scene, for example, it's like, yeah, okay. Did you go to this party? Oh, you didn't go to there. You're kind of less than kind of thing. You know, oh, I'm at all the parties. You're the kind of up, you know, up there in that little ecosystem. Then you go to those parties and you got to function at the party. Right. So you can't just be, go to the party and be like, no, nah, I'm not drinking or whatever. They're like, oh, you're lame. You know, you're not fitting in the party at all. Mm. So you want to fit in. So you're going to do the, you know, you're obviously going to drink. And then what if they're doing some some other drugs in the yep. back room, the cool room, the VIP room, the secret room or whatever. If you're not part of that, you're sort of, eh, you're the minion. You're not one of the VIPs. So you want to yeah. be one of the VIPs. So yeah. You got to function. Yeah. There. There's a whole peer pressure thing wrapped up inside the ecosystem. Oh yeah. That's like the primary driver of the ecosystem. Oh yeah. You Cause, it, yeah. Cause even the positive things like, oh, where are you get, where are you, uh, where are you getting your MBA? Yeah. Like, so they got all these 18, well, no, 19, whatever, 20, 21 year old college kids that are like, where are you going to get your MBA? Where are you going to get your MBA? Where are you applying? Where are you applying? Where are you applying? Where are you applying? Oh, yeah. And if you're not applying to the whatever, then you're a little bit down on that ecosystem. And you know what? No one cares. Well, I can't say no one cares because there are people that are going, hey, we want to get someone from this school. Cool. Mm -hmm. Fine. That's a little tiny subset of the same ecosystem yeah and but if you're talking about like yeah if you're talking about people outside the ecosystem no they don't care they don't care people care if you're capable and then so yes. a lot of times if you're like oh you got your mba from here okay that's an established ca- you know capable they're gonna you right. know put out some good students yep. or some good uh, trained people or whatever then there's that but it's not like they don't care about what you care about right now you mm-hmm. know the fact that you got it from here it doesn't mean you're like awesome the thing that's so hard for kids is they just can't see outside the ecosystem is their world. Yeah. yeah. And so introducing people to this concept that there are in fact these random ecosystems that actually no one cares about yeah. is a positive thing. Yeah. Don't get caught up in them. Yeah. Don't get caught up in trying that. Yeah, Especially not like negative sorry. ones. Yeah. But you have, you have what, there's also people take positive ecosystems and turn them negative because they start getting the ego involved like like that's right jujitsu is totally positive ecosystem hey we're just here to train we're here to have fun and all of a sudden it turns into drama because we haven't (laughs) talked too much about the jujitsu drama and i i'll be honest with you one of the reasons that we don't talk a lot about the jujitsu drama is probably because we don't deal with it a lot because we have a very open door policy at our gym Mm -hmm. and we're just kind of cool, and we just want to train jiu-jitsu and want everyone else to train jiu-jitsu. And I think San Diego at large is very similar to that because there's just jiu-jitsu everywhere. Yeah. So we all just kind of know each other. And so I think that has something to do with it. And I also think there's less jiu-jitsu drama now than there was 10 years ago. Yeah, for sure. You know, 10 years ago, it was like, that's my student. Yeah, yeah. You went to my other, you went to someone else's academy? Cool, you're out of my academy forever. Yeah. I banish you. <laughs> yes. Right, that w- there was that. that kind of drama. Is yeah. there still that kind of drama? There probably is some, yeah, but not as bad as it used to be. Yeah, but they took close. a positive ecosystem and turned it into negative ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, I would imagine that's kind of everything. Like even okay, so my nephew gets good grades, really good grades, mm-hmm. but he takes it. You know how like certain students they take their grades like super seriously. Mm-hmm. They get one bag, or yeah. they're late for school. Like bro, wait, <laughs> if to me. If, let's say my mom brought me to school. Bro, if you have to explain to me that you weren't worried about being late <laughs> when you were 10, <laughs> it's unnecessary. <laughs> but go on. Wildly for, unnecessary. For, for, the, for, the, yeah. for the people, we'll let you explain how much you didn't care about le- being late, even as a child. Go ahead. <laughs> Especially for school. Put it this way. If I was late, had to get a tardy slip. <laughs> bro, the connection between that and, like, grades and success in life was literally non-existent. <laughs> bro, the, so let's say let's say the bus was late. Well, or, like, I would say maybe that's how you ended up <laughs> showing up late all the time. But go ahead. It's con- possible. Continue. It's very possible. So if my parents or my mom or dad or whatever, if they were driving me to school and they were running late, bro, I, me caring was literally at a zero. I didn't care at all. In fact, I was like, cool. I, I don't have to spend as much time, you know, at school. And not that I was bad at school or anything. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying, like, bro, I didn't care about that stuff at all. Anyway, my point is, some people are the opposite. Some people mm-hmm. are like, well, I can't be late for school. It's like school yeah. is like everything in their grades and stuff like that. That's positive. That's really good, actually. 
But it can get out of hand. That's the thing. It can yeah. get out of hand. Yeah. Where you get kids freaking out. You get kids cheating. Cheating, freaking out. Freaking uh, out. Taking weird drugs to like yeah. study like a lot or whatever. Yeah. All yeah. those things. All those things are bad. And all of them are real, related to the fact that they think that that ecosystem is the whole world. It's everything. Yeah. And, and let's be honest. I mean. How much did that ecosystem affect you? You didn't even show up to school on time or do any homework. You seem to be doing all right. <laughs> well, now you know. you're here, king of the podcast uh, ecosystem, yeah. Echo Charles. <laughs> oh, yeah. So everyone should do that, right? No, man. <laughs> yeah, crazy. Yeah, I think if if you take, and not, not that I'm like the epitome of, or the poster child for great parenting advice, nothing like this, but I think like the more you take your kids and see other stuff outside mm-hmm. of school, kind of their mind is gonna not just be attached to like the school scenario, you know? Well, that's a whole debate, you know, that you could have like, but here's a real simple question. Does, is your kid, if your kid goes, is your kid 10 years old, they're in fifth grade, and they don't wanna miss school, so they don't go with you to Kawhi. Whatever. Kawhi. They don't go experience something. Like, yeah, that that I, I guarantee you that the experience in Kawhi is way more beneficial educationally, spiritually, yeah, potentially. athletically sure. Sure. than hey, they, they missed three days of Man. math. Yeah. Like, bring the math book. Bring it, yeah. Or the reading. Yeah, for sure. And, and it's not just Kawhi either. Like, you know, I mean, even just going to to see what you do at work or whatever. Yeah. Like I used to take my kid to, you know, go in training sites. Yeah. <sighs> Are you kidding me? Best thing ever. Oh yeah. And and I'm not even necessarily saying have a miss school to see this stuff. I'm not necessarily saying that. Mm. Um, but I'm just saying like everything isn't like okay, go home, do homework. And it's like everything. If you if you uh, create this idea that school is everything in their head, then, you know, it's, mm-hmm. they're going to tend to think that, I think. But, you know, if you see, you know, let them see other places where you work or whatever, whether yeah. it be on the weekends or summertime, whatever, you know, so you just see other things, they realize, oh, okay, school isn't everything, you know. And what you're really showing them is this is one ecosystem in the world. It's yeah. called school. It's an important one, yeah. but there's no reason to get crazy. There's other ecosystems out there that are also cool and good oh, yeah. all right keep detached don't get stuck in ecosystems all right next question i am stuck in a prolonged period of things not going my way professionally or socially all that really is going on well is my time management still even after having owned up to my part in getting here i still seem stuck in a failure loop Okay, so what's being addressed here is the prolonged period of things not going away, uh, and and we know that a key part of getting out of a rut like this or a failure loop is taking ownership of those failures, of those problems. That's very important, but guess what? That alone doesn't solve them at all. Just saying, I didn't get promoted, okay, it was my fault, period. That doesn't solve the fact that you didn't get promoted. I'm not getting called back to do this other contracting job. It's my fault. Does that mean you get called back? No, it doesn't mean anything. Taking ownership means that you actually have to identify the problem you know you're responsible for it, and then you actually have to solve the problem. That's what you have to do. Just taking ownership of the problem doesn't make it go away. You have to take ownership of the problem, you have to take ownership of finding a solution, and then you have to take ownership of implementing that solution. So this is real straightforward. Now, there's one little tiny part that I wanna point out, which you may or may not have noticed, Echo Charles, and I'm gonna point it out. (laughs) So, pay attention to this. Last sentence in the question. Still, even after having owned up to my part in getting here, Mm. I still seem stuck in a failure failure loop. What'd you notice about that, Echo Charles? (laughs) As if there's another part. There's a whole other part, maybe even parts. Yeah. Right? There's multiple 
facets yeah. of the world that are conspiring yeah. to keep you in this failure loop. Yeah, it's like that tone of when someone's like, hey, I did my part. I did my job, hands up, you know, kind of thing. Totally. I did my job. That's not my job. The other parts that are more implied, I guess, now that you're kind of uncovering them or whatever, it's like there's this other job that someone else is sort of part. So know? this is the thing. And this is what this is what makes this very challenging is this idea that like, but how could I possibly control this or that? How can I possibly take ownership of the fact, now this is a weak one, how can I possibly take ownership of the fact that my boss is an idiot and fired me? How can that be my fault? That he didn't see how good I was, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, we see what's going on there. You obviously aren't being introspective and taking a look and saying, okay, this is obviously my fault. Here's what I need to change. So there's things like that where you go, look, you're just not, it was same thing with relationships, right? She broke up with me. How can I own that? Well, maybe you look at yourself and you see how you acted as a partner in that relationship. And if you just wanna look at that person and say it was her fault, she was crazy, and she was, it was her fault. She didn't understand how awesome I was. Yeah. That's not, that's the, that you, you, you need to take ownership of your own behavior. Why did she think that? Mm-hmm. Now you do get to these things where you have no control. Uh, so got asked a question. Uh, a guy said, my I lost my girlfriend to opiate overdose, yeah. dead. She died. Yeah. How do I take ownership of that? And so I expanded that question because that's one of those things where you look at, I, you know, when you look at it, you go, how can you take ownership of that? This person did so much drugs and it wasn't like I, I like, okay, I don't know the specifics of the situation, but if you know I'm doing everything I can to help my girlfriend and then one day I come home and she's OD'd, she kicked, she's dead, okay, how can I, t- I wasn't even there, right? And I, I, let's just say I'd done everything, taken her to rehab, done, done all this stuff and as far as I could tell, she was clean and then behind my back without telling me she did this, right? So it's almost like, okay, that's as much separation as I can get. Mm-hmm. How do you take ownership of a situation like that? And so here's what I went on to say to this guy. I said, this might seem like a unique situation, but it's not because there's things that occur in our lives that we actually don't have any control over. For instance, most horrible, you, your family member, someone, you know, gets cancer, gets a horrible terminal disease. How do you take ownership of that? And the answer is in these cases, when things that are truly beyond your control occur, what you take ownership of is how you respond to them. That's, that's what you take ownership. How do you respond to you lose your girlfriend to drugs, your kid gets cancer, you get cancer, something, you get this horrible disease. How do you respond to that? That's what you can take ownership of. And that's what you have to take ownership of. So. I guess my point in saying that is yes, there are absolutely things that you cannot control and what you can control is your reaction to them when they unfold. That makes sense. What scares me about this guy is he's saying he's owned up to his part, but that means he's blaming someone else. And I can, th- the amount of things that we have zero control over is very small. Mm-hmm. So many things, if we look at ourselves and say, what could I do better? What could I do different? How can I make an adjustment here? How can I adapt to the way this boss is? How can I adapt to the way this girl is that I'm trying to have a relationship? And by the way, that might not be the best relationship. Maybe that's part of what you need to do, is take ownership of the fact that you're addicted to this. That's what he's saying. This guy here is saying he's so social. I'm assuming he's got some <coughs> problems with his female friends, right? Or or friends in general. Mm-hmm. Hey, did anyone want to come watch UFC? Oh, not really. <laughs> I'm I'm buying, guys. Oh, it's okay. We're going to go to, a, you know. So mm-hmm. I'm just there watching it by myself. 
I can't believe that, you know? What's wrong with everyone else? No, actually, what's wrong with me? Mm-hmm. Now, truth be told, I don't want to watch the UFC with anybody else generally. I just want to sit alone sure. and watch the fights. No commentary, no questions. Don't ask me a question. Sure. What was that move? No. I'm watching the fight. That's interesting. Everyone just be quiet. A lot of times, some of us, we like to demonstrate our professional knowledge Mm -hmm. of the subject, Mm -hmm. you know? So, uh, answer here. You need to look at the, the reason that you're probably stuck in this loop continually is because the things that you're blaming on other people, take ownership of them, get them fixed. Take ownership of them and get them fixed. Take ownership of them. Make some moves. Take ownership of them. Look what you can do different. That's what you have to do. Check. Uh, Next question. In your recent book, Leadership Strategy and Tactics, you mentioned establishing trustworthy relationships with superiors. You speak of performance and compelling tasks. Completing tasks. Oh, completing tasks, yes. Performance and completing tasks. You stated, boss wants me to fill out some extra paperwork. I'll do it. Boss needs me to cover a shift for someone else on the team. I've got it. Boss has a nasty low reward mission that needs executing. I'm all over it. Page 4950. How does this separate you from being a yes man, especially when being a yes man is looked upon so negatively these days? What are your thoughts? Yeah, so there's actually, uh, maybe he hasn't gotten there, but there's a whole section in the book that's called yes man yeah and why you don't want to be a yes man because if you're a yes man you don't push back when a situation requires there to be pushback mm. so so re- read a little bit more uh but to make it quite simple being a yes man is saying yes to everything regardless of whether it's a good idea or not building relationships and establishing a good communication and a good uh, rapport with your superior is totally different than being a yes man. Mm -hmm. Part of it is saying yes, because if you resist everything that they say to you, they don't really think, they don't really value your opinion. They just know that you're just a a no man. No, we can't do, no, we can't. You're you're Mr. Negative. Mm -hmm. A yes man's just gonna do whatever. So what you do is you say yes when you can. Some menial task, that's what he's talking about, some extra paperwork, cool, I'll do it. Some some cover a shift for someone else, cool, I got it. I can do those things, those are, those are easy, they're not impacting my team, we're good. Uh, nasty low reward project that needs to get done, cool, I got it, let's go, bring it, bring it, I'm here, it's, it's gonna help the team, awesome. Oh, you want me to do something that's gonna negatively affect the team and put Massive amounts of capital at jeopardy or put p- people in risk or put safety at risk. You want me to do that? Hold on, boss. No. Boss, and I wouldn't be just, no, boss, I'm not doing it. Mm. But I go through the book how you actually approach those situations so that you're not a yes man. So when you, when it reco- when there comes a situation that unfolds that you actually need to say no, you can say no and it gets listened to. That's the difference. Leadership strategy and tactics get some. It's all in there. Kind of, uh, you know, so many of the questions in leadership strategy and tactics, there's so many of the answers that I give in there are based on the questions that I get asked all the time. And so really so many of the questions that I'm hearing now, I have the answer in leadership strategy and tactics. I'm trying not to just say, well, refer to the book, page 98. Oh, refer to the book, page 64. I'm trying not to do that, but... Just FYI, yeah. for anyone that's out there, it's in there. You can read more about it. <laughs> All right, next question. I was hoping for some guidance. Kind of a similar question, too, but go on. Yes. I was hoping for some guidance. I'm going to cut you off again. No, no I just did that for fun. Yeah. Oh, I dig it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I was hoping for some guidance on how to play the game with a situation at work. I work in an in an aerospace machine shop. I'm doing this apprenticeship to be a me- machinist. Mechanist? Machinist, right? Machinist. Yeah. <laughs> this means that I'm supposed to get specific types of on-the-job training with a set, an, set number of hours each 
with a set number of hours each. Okay. I go to school I once. I can tell a week. we're going to re roll this thing, huh? No, 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 no. Okay. Are you going to roll with it? No, no, no. Okay, yeah. cool. Hey, cool. I, you know, humble I, man. I, I humble think we man. can discern kind of what he's asking okay. at the end of the day. Anyway, set numbers of hours. Normally, uh, you get a little sensitive. If you make some mistakes, you're like, I'm just going to take this from the top. Bro, my whole life isn't one big mistake, so whatever. Come on. Let's go. <laughs> an expression anyway right. i go to school once a week to supplement it the problem is they won't give me any work that fills those designations i'm doing my best at the menial paperwork they've had had me on for a while without complaint it's a real problem though when i'm paying out of pocket for the tuition that comes with the program every month spent not getting required required training adds to the five years it takes to complete the ojt on the job training how do I get them to move me where I'm supposed to be? Do I just continue to do the best at what they give me and accept the loss of time and money? Yeah, so you gotta remember the book, The Dichotomy of Leadership, Humble, Not Passive. So yeah. this guy is being humble, playing the game. Hey, I'll do the menial paperwork. I'll I'll work these extra hours. I'll do these things that don't really help me. He's playing, he's playing the game and he's being humble, right? But he's also, it sounds like, being passive, meaning he needs to up his assertiveness to say, hey, listen, hey, hey, boss, I just want to let you know, I, want to, I, I put together this spreadsheet of what I've actually get, a, get accomplished, and here's the things that I want to get done, and I know I'm trying to knock out all the stuff, and I'm here to support the team, but I also need to get these things done. Can you help me get these things scheduled so that I can be more value to you and the team? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you build the relationship through playing the game. You build the relationship by giving support wherever you can, but at the same time, that doesn't mean that you just roll over and never stand up for yourself. Yeah. That's not what we're talking about here. The difference is you're not building a relationship just so you can take care of yourself, mm -hmm. right? That's different. That means I'm just looking out for me. Yeah. You're building a relationship so that you can move down the right path, which is, by the way, is gonna make you more a bigger asset to the team. Yeah. So it's a win-win situation. Make sure you build that relationship and then talk to them about what it is you're trying to get done, why you're trying to get it done, and that way we move forward down the path. And by the way, if they're like, shut up and just do this paperwork, or shut up, we're not gonna help you, cool. Maybe we need to find a place that has a little bit better uh, opportunity for me, and I'll start to float that out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Humble, not passive. I remember a long time ago, you'd say, uh, you, you, you this, use this word, efficient be more efficient rather than make it easier for me. You know, like even though they're essentially the same thing in certain circumstances where mm. it's like, oh yeah, this will make it easier for me to become an <laughs> asset kind of thing. But for whatever reason, maybe like just the way that sounds. Well, yeah, it, it sounds like you're looking out for, for yourself. Me. And yeah. yeah, yeah. But if you say it, it'll get me to be a more valuable asset in a more efficient way, mm -hmm. ooh, who could say no to that? Who could right? say no to that? Because what know. company doesn't want efficiency? None. No, we want to take the hard road. Yeah, yeah. We want to do things that don't make any sense. Yeah. We want to do things inefficiently. No. Mm. Yes, efficiency is important. Not yes. only in jujitsu. Yep. Not only in judo. Yep. But in business and in life. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> All right. So there's one more little topic that I wanted to bring up. And. Really, it's, it's another question that I got at, at Jocko Live, and I got this question or a version of this question a couple of different times, and they all, they all, a couple different versions of this question, but the same question. And the question is, it's something like this, something along the lines of, I've been pretty successful at this point in my life and I'm having trouble finding the motivation to take it to the next level. So, you know, it's like people that say, oh, so you, you know, you make decent money, yep, but yeah, we're doing really well, and you're, you're working out, yep, I'm healthy, yep, I'm good, and your family's taking care of you, yep, I'm good, good, good time with my family. But you're not able to, like, get the extra workout. You're not, you know, you're skipping some days. You're not eating great. You're not making the calls that you need to make. You're not expanding your eyes, and that's what's going on, right? And so that's what we're getting at. We get someone that's sort of in a good spot, kind of across the board, right? Kind of in a good spot across the board. And so I'd kind of establish that fact that they're in a good spot across the board. Mm -hmm. And then I'd say, well, sounds like you're in a good spot across the board, 
Are you happy with that? And are you comfortable with where you're at? And the answer would be no. And then I'd say, are you sure? And then they'd say, yeah, I'm sure I'm, you know, I want to do more. And then I said, that's a lie. That's a lie. That's a lie. Because if you really weren't happy and you really wanted to improve your health even more, and you really wanted to improve your financial situation more, and you really wanted to just broadly improve your life, then you wouldn't have any problem at all finding the discipline. The discipline would actually find you. And that's where I'm at. That, that, you wanna know why people are like, oh, you don't sleep very much. You wanna know why? Because discipline finds me. Because I know I, w- I know I can do more, and I want to do more. And I know I'm not happy where I'm at and comfortable where I'm at. So if you're telling yourself, no, I'm not happy where you're, where you're at, then I'm going to tell you that's actually a lie. You are comfortable. You are comfortable. Because if you weren't comfortable, then it would drive you. The discipline would show up. Now, this is where I kind of, I, I kind of, have to go a little bit deeper. So the, what I just said, if you tell yourself the truth, then you'll find discipline. The framework of discipline is the truth. The framework of discipline is the truth. And I have to, and I didn't do a good job when I got asked this question, I didn't do a good job of connecting all the dots because it actually is one level deeper. It's one level deeper and it looks like this. If you're saying that you can't find discipline and I'm telling you it's because, that's because you are comfortable where you're at, that is also a lie. That is also a lie. Look, telling yourself that you don't need to get out of bed in the morning, telling yourself that you don't really need to work out or you don't need to go harder or you don't need to do more in your job or be more disciplined in the way that you live, If you tell yourself those things, that's actually a lie. Because the fact of the matter is, think about this, the fact of the matter is that you're not comfortable, you're not happy. You're not okay with where you're at because that's why you're asking this question right now. You're asking this question because you know you can do more. You know you can be more. And that's the truth. That's the truth. And it eats you up. And it makes you ask these questions. Ask the question to me and ask the question to yourself. And the answer is the truth. You know it, I know it, we all know it, that the framework of discipline is the truth. If you tell yourself the truth, the real truth, the absolute, categorical, unconditional, unabated, unmerciful truth, if you do that, you will find discipline. Discipline equals freedom. Discipline is rooted in the truth. The truth will set you free. And what does that calculus work out to? Discipline equals freedom. And I think that's all I've got for tonight. So, Echo Charles. Yes. It seems like we want the truth over here. Yes. So that we can do more and we can be more. Be more. 100%. Is there anything that you know of 
that helps reveal the truth to us. Yes, jujitsu. The mats <laughs> never lie. The mats do you know not that lie, one? my friend. No, they do not. No, yeah, man. When you're when you're uh, when you make eye contact with that guy who's a little bit better than you, mm-hmm. maybe bigger, maybe we'll give you a scenario where you got to put out more effort than maybe you want to that day. When you make eye contact, and then you like look away. Right, everyone sees that. Mm-hmm. Oh. That? oh, you mean pre-roll? Pre-roll, yes. Oh, there's like a scenario that could unfold, but we haven't connected yeah. eye contact for the roll. Yeah. It's like oh, yeah. it's like uh, avoidance. Avoidance. Yeah. Oh, that's, everybody knows. That's one of one of the many attempted lies that we sort of try to you know perpetuate in ourselves. Like, oh yeah, like I'm good, right? That's what people kind of. Mm. They want to be good at jujitsu, I think, you know, on the mats. You know Akbar? Sure, of course I do. Yeah. He's really sick jujitsu. <laughs> and he's super, like, hard to roll with. Yeah. Just because he's yeah. strong and wiry and athletic and, and freaking good and, and doesn't stop. stop. Yeah. But I have, like, an unwritten rule with him. No yeah. matter what, 100%, if, if either one of us wants to roll, we roll. Yeah. It doesn't matter what's going on. If one of us wants to roll, we roll. Yeah. And, and most of the time... He wants to roll, I don't, and I roll with him every time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's how. And and that kind, I mean, let's face it, that you, like you have mixed emotions about those kind of, because you see him and you're like, because you have it in your head, like you can't not roll with that person. I have that with Noah, mm. where if he's there, it's like. It's on. It's uh, And him, he's like, I don't know if, man, he's been kind of working me recently yeah so it's like oh man i see him i'm like i know this is gonna be like a hard roll mm-hmm. but i can't not roll with him like that yeah. would defeat the whole purpose of my existence here right now if i like don't <laughs> roll with him you know roll with noah for sure oh yeah. and he's the same way he's coming at you the whole time yeah. he's freaking awesome at jujitsu yeah. he's in good shape he's strong he's got he just got it he's just gonna bring it yeah you just gotta be you just like yeah. that's the way it is yeah akbar we're gonna roll same. yeah so uh, noah akbar like these guys that it's like okay if they weren't here, it'd be it would be an easier day, regardless. One hundred percent, kind of thing. Yeah, <laughs> but not everyone's like that, you know. Yeah. And actually, there can be guys who are like even actually better than you, but you roll with them, and it's like it's not this huge like it's not that like hard of a roll, mm. you know. It's like there's just different dynamics. Yeah, 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 yeah. But the lie that we can tell ourselves, even though you're the only one you're lying to, everyone, everyone can see what you're doing. When you like do avoid that. Yeah. Now there are situations that unfold, then this is one that I do. So let's say I have an injury. Yes. Right? Legitimate injury. I will let's say a normal day for me is like, okay, I'm gonna do eight rounds. You know, eight six minute rounds. Cool. That's normal. Like that's a good roll for me. I had a good time. You know, whatever. It takes an hour, whatever. This is a minute rest or whatever. <laughs> sure. Minute rest. Like um so maybe not but but anyways. If I'm if I'm injured, sometimes I got to be like, okay, I can only do four rounds, because then it's just odds yeah. that I'm gonna right. re-injure something stupid. And yeah. I just I'm like, hey, I, what I try to do is tell people beforehand, mm-hmm. so that way I'm not being that guy. Like, yeah. if you want to roll with me, now is the time, because yeah. in four rolls, right. maybe five. <laughs> sure, you know. Then you I'm can. gonna then I'm gonna call it. Yeah. So. It does happen, and I guess the reason that I'm saying that is just to be like, well, I'm gonna roll no matter what. If you're injured, and like you know the deal, like when you're injured, you have you can you can you can get lucky for like three four rolls, and like okay, I didn't tweak anything, we're good. Yeah. It didn't get worse. Yeah. That fourth fifth roll, now your sixth roll, you're tired, mm-hmm. you're giving a, giving up a little bit more, and all of a sudden that's when you get hurt. Mm-hmm. So, just a. Just a little tale of caution. Yes, big time. And you know, one it you know, it's easy kind of like when we're just sitting here, you know, not in the situation. It's easy to be like, Oh yeah, you just you just work around the injury and if you gotta get caught in a submission, that's how, you know. No, it's not whatever. a submission that you're gonna get that's easy. You hope that someone if you got a sore elbow, you hope that what hurts you is oh, someone puts an arm lock and you go, Oh, tap early, right? right. That's what you hope it is. Yeah. What you don't hope it is is you're rolling and turning and your arm gets caught in a bad spot and now you re injure it. Yeah. There's no tapping from that. That's just yeah. another injury. Yeah. So the I mean what I had in my head was like um or you know, your knee or, or whatever, whatever, rib, whatever. Mm-hmm. And you're like, I'm just gonna go like kinda little lighter, you know? <laughs> right? Exactly. <laughs> you, 
<laughs> you roll one round, and then you roll run one round with like no or something. Bro, go light. No way, man. I'm and it's you can consciously be going. Oh yeah, I'm gonna mm-hmm. go light. But start rolling. Yeah, just see how much you can remember to go light when you're you know things get competitive. Whatever, yeah. whatever. Sure. What do you always Look. say to me like when you do a good move to me and you say, uh, Yeah, you sense of urgency. Yeah, you, you say, just uh, escalate. That's, that's a big victory for you. <laughs> You get my sense of urgency to increase, and it's like the biggest W. Oh, yeah, because you're just so good. And you say like, it to me, too. Yeah. Well, I don't say that it's a big W, but I do say you I go, recognize oh, your you sense of urgency. A little sense of urgency yeah, there. You're down. all happy. <laughs> anyway, cool. when you're in the moment, whether you can control it fully or not or whatever, I, I would say you just decrease the chance of you staying safe. As time goes on, yes, you just that's just like the numbers. Yep, you, like just, just, just how you odds. Think, odds. The odds are, yeah, I made it through four rounds. I'm okay. Right. Cool, I'm walking off the mat right now. Right. So that's like the opposite of a lie. You're like being so so truthful with yourself. You're like, hey, you know, and you're and you're doing the right thing. The lie comes when you're like, you're not injured. You're just maybe not feeling up to it. Maybe you're hungover. I don't know. Maybe not you, but mm-hmm. you know, a person. And then you say, well, you know, I'm this or I'm sick or I'm this. And you say that excuse or whatever to yourself. Mm-hmm. And then, like, you avoid the hard uh, rolls. Yeah, I had Wes. Um, like, I was, I was training. I was deep into some rounds. And Wes, is, and Wes was on the other mat. And he comes over. And Wes is a beast, too. Like, I mean, he's just strong. His jiu-jitsu is awesome. And he, every time it's going to be a gut check. Mm-hmm. And I'm, like, sit up against the wall. I'm done. And he's like, hey, you want to get one? And I was like, and I, th- I said, no, mm-hmm. you know, I was like, no. And then, and then I was like, bro. And then like 30 seconds went by and I was like, all right, bro, I'm yeah. sorry. That's just weak. Like, yeah. cause I wasn't done yet. Yeah. I knew I wasn't done. Mm-hmm. There's times where I've been like, Hey, no, I can't, I can't roll. Like I've got to, I'm no, I'm done yeah. for the night. Mm-hmm. It's not smart for me to roll. I need to have discipline the, more than anything else. Right. Yeah. Cause you know, you, when you're injured, you're there. It's like, you want to roll so bad. Yeah. You feel like a caged animal. Yep. Just wanted to get on the mats of justice. Yeah, pretty much in any time you're there and you're not rolling. Injured, it's sick, the worst, man. Working, uh, in my case, you know, filming, or whatever. Yeah. No, I mean, you, you kind of, that's just how. But yeah. But the, again, that's like the opposite of the lie. Like your, your, your truth is, is very, uh, how should I say, strong. Like you don't, like the lie, like hits you hard when you begin to lie yeah. to yourself, you know. Yeah. But some people they they can just roll with it, but everyone sees what you're doing. Yeah. Everybody, you know, or the guy who's tying his belt every ten seconds, you know, like oh, you know, but I see what you're doing. Yeah. You're trying to perpetuate some lie. Yeah. But the mats, they don't lie. So that's why. That's why we think jujitsu is a positive thing. Sure, I think so. It does expose our truth or maintain our truth. It's a good e- ecosystem to be in. I think so. You got to be careful like all ecosystems. Mm-hmm. But in that ecosystem, this is what we do care about. What kind of gi we have. <laughs> <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Come on. We all check it out. Like, well, what? put it this way. We I, don't want to be walking around with a second rate gi that's made in wherever, not here. Yeah. Yes. No, we don't. What do you want your gi to say? Look, I train jujitsu, I work hard, and I support this country and its workers. Yes, that's what I want my gi to say. Yeah, there's only one gi that says that. Yeah, but there's one, only one gi that says that. Yeah, and that's the origin gi. It is and I think gi. we all know that. You know, so yes, the question: What do, what gi do I get when I do jujitsu? When I start jujitsu? When I compete in do in jujitsu? You get an origin gi. Yes. You get an origin rash guard for the no-gi scenarios yes, that unfold. Yep. And then, since you can't wear a gi and a rash guard in public, unless you're John Donaher, because he's just representing that rash. Is he still yep. representing the rash guard super hardcore? As far as I know. Yeah, but no, I, he's definitely sure. so legit. We need to send him some rash guards. Anyways, if you're not John Donaher and you're going to go out, you don't really want to wear gi pants sure. and a rash guard, you can get other clothing yeah. from Origin Maine, such as jeans. t-shirts, jeans, mm-hmm. sweatshirts, hoodies. Hoodies. What were you gonna say? I think sweatshirts and hoodies kind of covers it. 
covers. Okay, well, what were you going to say? You, were you going to say jeans? Yeah. Jeans. jeans. Delta 68. <laughs> Delta 68s. Are those out yet? We're, we're working, <laughs> we're working on, on that we're one. We're working I, on it. Hey, working on it. Hey, if you're working on it, you're working on it. All good. Uh, I jeans. actually told Pete, let's pre, and I don't like to do this, but let's do the pre-order thing mm-hmm. so we can actually get the demand signal because people are demanding the Delta 68s. Yes, they are. Because I talked them up because they are truly the greatest things I've ever put on my legs. <laughs> there you go. Also, joggers. Those are not the greatest things I've put on my you legs. Know, but but they're know. not really for me. No. I'm not a joggers kind of guy. Because you don't, well, yeah. I mean, you know, fashionably speaking, uh, yeah, that's not you. Uh, comfort, you know, that's kind of down there on your list of priorities. Yeah. So I get it. Right now, those are just two things that I'm not really super concerned yeah. about. <laughs> exactly. Although, oddly enough, the comfort of the Delta 68s is one of the things that makes them very epic. Yeah. It's just like the cherry on top. If you came scenario. to Jocko Live, I was wearing Delta 68s. Yes, I know. If you that. see me in public and I'm wearing uh, jeans, they're Delta 68s. Dig it. Well, there you go. OriginMain.com is where. Also, supplements. These are important supplements. Joints for your joints. Supplements for your joints. That's important. Mm-hmm. Try lift. You can be the strongest guy in the world. Your shoulder's not working. L- let me ask you this. Is this jacked up? So a guy hit me up on social media and was like, hey, you're old. Whatever. <laughs> how do you, you know, how do you maintain, like, how do you do this? And, you know, I, is one of those things where I was like, well, do I just tell him, like, straight up, man, if you're not on Joint Warfare and Krill Oil, you're just wrong. Like, step number one, get on Joint Warfare and Krill Oil. Seriously. Super Krill, Joint Warfare, that's what you want to do. Now, the thing that I told him also is, very consistent, yeah. right? I'm. I don't. I'm not one of those guys that takes three weeks off from doing anything mm-hmm. and then jumps back into the to, to squat. Like no, I'm working out. For all practical purposes, I'm working out every single day. Now, is there occasions where life gets in the way? Sure. Yep. That's what it's called a day off. That's mm-hmm. why I don't take voluntary days off. But I'm telling you. If you want to maintain like the activity at a high level and you're an older person, I mean, I'm only 48. I feel like I'm 21 or 22 maybe. Let's say 27. How about that? Sure. But Joint Warfare and Krill Oil, those are the supplements that you're specifically talking about right now. So... I can't recommend them strongly enough. And I should have just told that guy, listen, be consistent, work out, do a good job, warm up, and take Krill Oil and Joint Warfare. But then you feel like, oh, I'm just, you know, yeah, you know what I mean? Just selling this guy's stuff. stuff. Like, bro, this is it. Yeah. So I actually did him a disservice. Yeah, because that's true. When you go like every day and consistent, your body's sorted, you know, for lack of a better way of putting it in as far as details go. But your body's just used to it. But at the same time, yeah, you know, like your joints are taking a beating if you're pushing hard. Which I am. Which, yeah, I mean, why wouldn't you push hard? I mean, I yeah. guess maybe they're under some circumstance that's okay. But if you're pushing hard, yeah, your joints are going to be like kind of taking some of the brunt. Yeah, whatever, for sure. You know? So, yeah, if your joints can stay in the game, bro, it's like, yeah. Well, no, more important, if your joints can't stay in the game, you're out of the game. Yes. That's the problem. Yeah, that's the whole thing. It's like, hey, you can be big and strong, and your joints don't work, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You're it's only as strong as your weakest link. Make your weakest link your strongest link, joint warfare and krill oil. Mm-hmm. Uh, discipline go. Discipline, powder form, awesome. If you need a can of a tasty beverage that's actually good for you, yep. get yourself some di- discipline. Go. Oh, yeah. RTD. Ready to deploy. Yes. Or drink with that. Yeah, we, we prefer to play over here, I think. I understand. Also, milk. Mm-hmm. Protein in the form of a dessert. Mm-hmm. Additional protein. Mm-hmm. I know we're eating steak. I get it. It's true. It's mm-hmm. good. <laughs> but you want the dessert with some additional protein. Yeah. Some uh, To increase and improve your protein synthesis. Dang. <laughs> <laughs> Just got hit to that one. It's like when there's protein. Okay, so I was one of the guys who... Uh, who one of the many of us who yeah. you know what you you know what an anabolic window is? Yeah, it's like after you work out, you got a certain amount of time you yes. gotta eat within. Yeah, you gotta eat the protein and take take it in because that's when your body like kind of wants to take it in. If you miss that window, it doesn't take as much in. 
Mm-hmm. So apparently, <laughs> that's not as much of a thing. Apparently, <laughs> <laughs> from what I'm, bro, science has been disproven from 1994. <laughs> Well, there's been know. a controversy in the bro science world. Yeah, I know, man. Just just a shift, really. Mm, a, a, shift a, a paradigm, bro, a paradigm shift. shift in the bro science yeah. world. Yeah. So interesting, <laughs> so especially I, come from someone that has a doctorate in bro science. Well, Echo you Charles. Know, you know, I'm always staying on the. So cut, what do you? What is the edge. point? Uh, so we can drink milk anytime, and it's so <laughs> beneficial. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with me yes. having milk at 9.48 yeah. at night when I'm like, you know what? I want mm. dessert right now. Yeah. Cool. I'm gonna have some milk. Yeah. Yeah, basically, yeah. So it's more about uh, the protein rolling around in your system, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when your body needs protein to rebuild muscle, boom, you got some protein already in there. Whether you take it in 20 minutes after you lift Mm -hmm. or if, you know, you're just sort of taking it in throughout the day. There you go. Same thing goes for your children. They can take in protein at any time. They can also take in poison, sugar. But don't give them that. Give them the protein, the good stuff. Warrior kid milk. And then get yourself some Jocko White tea, by the way. Which is, as Echo Charles likes to point out, organic. It is certified. <laughs> certified organic. Hi, I'm Jocko Willink, organic certified tea salesman. Yep. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Who would have thought? Yeah. Look, it's not about the organic. It's about having an 8,000 pound deadlift, which is 100% guaranteed. Double blind placebo. Double blind placebo scenario. tested. Yeah. Get some. And by the way, all these items are available right now at the vitamin shop. So you probably, hopefully, have a vitamin shop near you. You can just go down there and pick up any of these items that you want, which is pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. Go check it out. By the way, this Friday, February 8th, in San Diego, California, at the vitamin shop, we're going to be there. Is that Friday or Saturday? Sorry, Saturday. Saturday, February yeah, I think it's Saturday. 8th. Yeah, it's Saturday, February 8th. We're going to be there. We're going to be there live. It is Saturday. We're going to be there. We're going to be there live. <laughs> yeah. Me, you, JP, and Dakota Meyer. Dak Savage. No. Dak Savage is actual. No. We'll be there. <laughs> Come on down and, and hang out. And people are like, will you sign books? Yeah, I'll sign whatever you want. Yeah. I mean, within reason. Within reason. I mean, yes. and by that, I only mean like I'm not signing. You know, body parts. Body parts. Yeah. Well, Mo- what if like someone's forehead? Certain that's body cool. parts I'm not going to sign. Yeah, yeah, I dig it. <laughs> I dig it. Good move. So, there you go. It's good. Origemain.com. Yes, origemain.com for all this stuff. Good stuff, by the way. Also, Jocko has a store. It's called Jocko Store. That's where you can get the death core stuff, the discipline equals freedom stuff. The good, quote unquote, good stuff. And when I mean stuff, that's T-shirts, hoodies, lightweight and heavy. Rash guards. More rash guards. Representative of the path directly. <laughs> While you're doing the jujitsu. I saw some people on the podium yeah, representing. I saw that too. Recently. Oh, oh yeah. Be on that one. Yeah, way to represent on that one. Appreciate everyone that represents the path. The path. Big time. And oh, yeah. the podcast. Oh, and yeah. the deaf core. Yes. In so, the yes. competition. Oh, yeah. Big time. Uh, but, yeah, a hat's on there as well. Cool stuff on there. If you like something, get something. Represent while you're on the path. JockoStore.com. Also, subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already. We are st- we don't know if that's important. Is it important? It's important. It's not not important. Overall, we're saying, yes, it's important. So, do it. Do subscribe. it. Subscribe. Subscribe. If, if you want. So good. It's beneficial. You don't if you're listening miss. to this, you should subscribe. Yeah. That's my opinion. Yes. Do Very beneficial. You want, though, on your you iTunes. Say. And don't forget that we also have the Grounded podcast. Yes. Where we talk about life jujitsu. We're looking like we're probably going to make some more of those in the very near future. Warrior Kid podcast. That is the best podcast that a child could listen to. Am I biased? Maybe. Am I right? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> and don't forget about Warrior Kids Soap. And I am overjoyed to inform you that we have a new soap out from irishoaksranch.com. It's got antibacterial, antimicrobial, microbial. Almost, almost. Good. Well, anyways, it's got really good stuff. If you're dirty, especially dirty in the tense of jujitsu, 
where you've got little creepy crawlies trying to get into your skin, mm-hmm. then you can get something that that we made, Young Aiden, and it's called Killer Soap. Go to irishoachranch.com so you can get yourself some killer soap and stay clean. Mm, stay clean, of course. Also, YouTube channel. We have a YouTube channel for the video version of this podcast and some excerpts on there. You want to share these excerpts? Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Do it. If your boss needs to hear this, don't do it like that. I'm just mm. saying if you sort of just sh- – anyway, um, good stuff on there. I think enhanced stuff as well. You can see Jocko and his – Things are exploding. Things are catching on fire. Sometimes, yeah. Things are cracking open. Sometimes, yeah. In, anyway. synchroniza- in synchronization with my words. Yep, and music cellos and whatnot yes the if last. you haven't heard echo's enhanced videos you may not know it echo is a cello enthusiast i yeah, well you know sure. every time he plays me one of his videos when the cello kicks in <laughs> i give him a look <laughs> anyway videos on there yes subscribe to the channel. youtube channel yeah what's YouTube it called channel. jocko podcast jocko podcast is what it's called yep, that's the one we also have something called psychological warfare and i got a great piece of information, a a great suggestion from someone, some trooper out there just made a great suggestion. The suggestion was when you talk about psychological warfare, you should describe it as a little psychological hitter. (laughs) As soon as I said it, I was like, you get credit, (laughs) credit. So yes, if you need a little psychological hitter, to help you get over some moment of weakness. Well, guess what? We got something for you. It's called Psychological Warfare. It's on iTunes, Google Play, other MP3 platforms. If you need a visual hitter, then go to flipsidecanvas.com where Dakota Meyer, speaking of, is making visual representations of the path that you can hang on your wall, on your ceiling, in your doorway. Keep you on the path. That's what you need to do. Mm-hmm. Got some books, Leadership Strategy and Tactics, the most recent, the answer to the answer to every leadership question that I've been asked on this podcast, that I get asked all the time. So Leadership Strategy and Tactics Field Manual, everyone that got it, thank you, uh, made it number one on a bunch of different lists, which was awesome, and I was super stoked. It was especially awesome if you're in the literary ecosystem. Then you go, oh, number one, everyone else doesn't care. So mm-hmm. I've kind of got one foot in that door because there's a bunch of people that I work with that are uh, in the literary world because that's what that's what it is, right? You yes. write a book, you're in the literary world. Yes. So that ecosystem. So you guys, even though none of you care, you all propelled me to the number one in that ecosystem that anyone that's outside the literary world, literary world doesn't care about. Mm-hmm. <laughs> People say, how do you stay humble? Guess what? No one cares about this stuff. (laughs) That's how. Leadership Strategy and Tactics. Got a bunch of kids' books. Way of the Warrior Kid 1, 2, and 3. Mikey and the Dragons for that littler kid. Discipline Equals Freedom Field Manual. Which people just take pictures of that Mm -hmm. and just post just a picture of the cover of the book. Yeah. Which I'm always like, credit. Credit. So Leadership Strategy and tactics is field manual too. The first field manual was discipline equals freedom field manual. The audio version of that is on iTunes, Amazon Music, Google Play, and other MP3 platforms. And then, of course, it all started with extreme ownership and the dichotomy of leadership, which I wrote with my brother Leif Babin about the lessons that we learned in combat and how you can use them in business and life. We got EF Online, which is leadership training online. And what this is, is a supplement. Actually, it doesn't even have to be a supplement. It could be the whole meal. If this is what you can do, then you want leadership training, go to EF Online. If you need it inside your company, inside your business, inside your team, you can contact echelonfront.com. That's my leadership consultancy. Echelonfront.com. What we do is solve problems through leadership. We got some musters coming up. up. We got... Well, all the ones that we've done have sold out. The ones that are coming up on deck are Orlando, Florida, Orlando, Dallas, Texas, Phoenix, Arizona, and Phoenix, Arizona. 
Go to extremeownership.com for those, all the events that we've ever done have sold out. So if you wanna come, go to extremeownership.com early so that you can get some. And last thing, we now have EF Overwatch and EF Legion. EF Overwatch aimed at executive leadership, taking folks that were in the military, leaders, senior leaders in the military, and placing them into civilian companies so that they can help that company move forward. That's our executive leadership placement firm. We also have EF Legion, which is frontline troops and frontline leaders. So if you've been in the military, if you're a veteran, and you want to find your next mission, if you're a senior leader, cool, go to EF Overwatch. If you're a junior leader, go to EF Legion. And companies that are looking for junior leaders or executive leaders, you can do the same thing. EFLegion.com or EFOverwatch.com. These are people that understand the principles that we teach and can apply them inside your business. And if you have not heard enough of my exceedingly slow talking and ludicrously serious tone, and you haven't had enough of Echo's marginally, marginally applicable metaphors, if you can't get enough of those two things, well, guess what? You can get more. We are available on the interwebs, on Twitter, Instagram, and on the Facebook. Echo, is that Echo Charles? And I am at Jocko Willink. And to final word here, thank you all for listening to the podcast. A podcast that exists thanks to your support. Thanks for listening, spreading the word, telling your friends. Thanks for getting some DEF core or some Origin gear, all of which supports this podcast. And of course, thanks to all the service members out there in uniform who protect the very freedoms that make this podcast possible. Also to our police and law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, EMTs, dispatchers, correctional officers, border patrol, secret service, all the first responders. And I saw a bunch of military members. I saw a bunch of first responders at all the Jocko Lives, and I appreciate you coming out. And I want to say thank you for providing an environment where we can live our lives as we see fit. And to everyone else out there, remember to tell yourself the truth. Remember to tell yourself the truth. You know what that means. The truth is you need to do more. The truth is you need to be more to reach your fullest maximum capacity and capability as a human being. And if you tell yourself that truth, you will find discipline. And if you find discipline, you will find freedom. So do not lie to yourself. And instead, get out there and get after it. And until next time, this is Echo and Jocko. Out.